Well, good morning, church. I uh, just want to say that I love you. I miss you. I was talking to Mark earlier this morning, and I said, I'm even being a bit of an introvert myself, um, this is uncharted waters, and, and I absolutely hate being away from uh, my faith family. And so I begin to think about, you know, there's, there's not an instance, we know that God is sovereign, so there's not anything that happens in our lives or in the world that God doesn't know about, that he's not in complete control over. So if God did allow uh, this pandemic to take place, what is it that we, um, God's children, can learn from it? And so I hope that rather than having a woe is me attitude, and it's easy for us to approach life that way when things are a little bit different than what we're accustomed to, I hope that you can look at this situation. I hope that myself, I can look at this situation and say, what does God want to teach me from it? And there's so many things as you look on social media, uh, if you watch the news, that uh, from a Christian standpoint that, that you'll hear people say, well, God's trying to awaken us, God's trying to open our eyes to something, and maybe, maybe that is the case. But I know one thing, we can't allow any type of disruption to our lives, um, control us, cause fear in our lives to take control over us to the point to where we just lose it from a, a mental standpoint, especially from a spiritual standpoint. So I hope that the things that are occurring, the things that are going on in our country and worldwide, I hope that they do draw us closer to the cross and create a greater longing inside of us for the return of Jesus. Um, I hope that through this time when we do all come back together, uh, that we'll have discussions about how God has grown us spiritually, about how this has caused us to cling more to the Word. It's caused us to cling more to the Lord. It's caused us to uh, take advantage of the opportunity that we have. We have a great opportunity uh, for those of you that maybe have not been the spiritual leaders of your household. This has been placed right in front of your face now to take the bull by the horns, so to speak, and lead as the spiritual leader in your house to, to teach your children, uh, men to, to t sit down and, and teach, with, uh, teach your wives and to pray with them and instruct them. Uh, and this is just give us opportunities I don't think we ever really uh, would have dreamed, we really would have ever imagined. So um, just a bit of a greeting there. We don't know how long this is going to stretch out, but we are going to make do uh, with what we have in the days to come, um, starting Wednesday, 6 o'clock on Wednesday night, uh, Brother Isaac and I are going to rotate um, teaching you uh, from God's Word, maybe teaching you different things as far as maybe a catechism, how to teach a catechism, how to go through and learn from a catechism. We think this will be very instructional for you, uh, very encouraging. Uh, he will start this Wednesday night at 6 p.m., and then we'll kind of rotate from there. So we wanted to give you that update and let you know that we are going to try to to get with you more than just on Sunday morning uh, by way of encouragement, just to let you know that, hey, we, we, we've not gone anywhere. Mount Zion Baptist Church still exists, uh, and we still exist for the glory of God, and, and we just want to be creative in the way that we in the way that we minister to you and keep in touch with you and your families. Uh, if you've got your Bible there at home with you, turn with me uh, to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and I've titled this morning's message, The Results of Serving Jesus. The Results of Serving King Jesus. So up until now, some of Jesus' ministry was kind of overshadowed by John the Baptist. The Jews were astonished that the office of the prophet had been reestablished after being absent for a period of about 400 years. And this man, Herod, that we're going to talk about this morning, was very familiar with John the Baptist. Knew a lot about John the Baptist and the things that he was hearing about. Jesus made him think that, he, that Jesus was John the Baptist brought back from the dead. When the ancient days, it was thought that the resurrection was a sign of judgment from God aimed at his enemies, which would include, obviously, Herod. The thought of this possibility was something that terrified Herod. It was something that he, it just, it just, it controlled every fiber of his being. And it can be terrifying to be a believer at times too, but it seems as if the shoe is on the other foot here for Herod, at least for now. But what does this text mean for believers today? 
How does this text speak to the church today? You know, so often we look for the benefits of life and we do everything possible to avoid troubles. I think that's just how we are wired. We love ease. Humanity loves things being easy. Uh, But the Christian life is anything but easy. The Christian life is a life of risk. Sometimes those risks are great. Sometimes those risks are small. They're minimal. Well, later on in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 10, Jesus says this. He says, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children in lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. What a beautiful promise for believers uh, that's guaranteed on the other side of this life. But what about now? What about the present? What about reality where we are currently at? Well, today's message is anything but a scare tactic. It's not a scare tactic at all, but rather it's a shot of reality for the believer. John's life is a great example of how being a faithful, fruitful servant of Jesus Christ Christ is a risk that's worth the reward. So I want you to read along with me in Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. The Bible says, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work at him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he's greatly perplexed, and yet heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent the executioner with his orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Please uh, go with me now to the Lord in prayer. Father, most of us are are, are living in times, God, that um, are brand new. Uh, They're brand new to us. and, And God, these are times that they scare many people. Uh, they cause anxiety to many people. God, there are times of uncertainty, but we know that this will pass. God, I pray that you would help us not to miss the opportunities during this time. Lord, we ask you to use this pandemic, God, to soften the hearts of the gospel, or to soften people's hearts to the gospel, God, and give us strength to share it. God, may we, may, may we not mace, miss this, this great opportunity that we have for, a, for, for personal and, and family spiritual resurgence. God, what a great opportunity we have. Help us, Lord, to rest in the promises of your word and to respond, God, in a way that honors you. God, I pray that you would just be with us during this time, Lord, and help us to give us understanding of your word. Lord, teach us, sanctify us. God, we, we pray that you give peace and comfort 
Lord, to the Wilkins family who uh, lost a, a great man uh, who many have grown to know and love in the years past. And Lord, give them comfort and peace that can only come from you. Lord, we love you. And we, God, instead of having a, a bad attitude, Lord, we anticipate the days ahead. We anticipate coming back together as a faith family, seeing one another again, rejoicing in what you have taught us through all of this. We love you. We ask you this, these things, Lord, in your precious son's name. Amen. Now, interesting, uh, something interesting about this passage is that there are only two passages in the whole gospel of Mark that don't focus completely on the life of Jesus. And this is one of them. And in the very first passage in chapter 1 is the other. But Jesus has just finished training his disciples and commissioning them into gospel ministry. And he's warned them. Not only in in, in the the last message that we looked at, but he's warned them all along of things that they were going to have to face, including the first thing that we see in this passage, in verses 14 through 16. So number one, people may fear you. When following Christ faithfully, people may fear you. Since Christ saved me, I have had a, a lot of different responses to being a believer in general, and I'm sure that you have as well, especially when you share your testimony with somebody. Sometimes you're going to face opposition. In our last passage of Scripture that we looked at in in Mark, verse 11 instructed the apostles how to respond when they received opposition. It says, And if any place will not receive you, will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Now, is that how we still handle things today? Maybe, maybe not in that same manner, but there's still a way that you and I should respond to opposition. And I want to share a few with you. First of all, number one, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when the world is opposed to the message of the gospel. You can't expect lost people to act like they are saved and receive the word with happiness like they are saved. And 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So don't be surprised when you are rejected, when there is opposition to the truth that you proclaim in your life. Don't be surprised by that at all. God is not taken by surprise, and you and I should not be as well. Number two, don't be outraged. Don't be outraged. All of us hate opposition, especially knowing that the message that we have, that we're delivering, is the most important message, is the the truth among all truths that people need to know and need to embrace. But try not to be outraged when faced with this type of uh, uh, opposition. Because our response, if we are filled with fear and with anger, how can we expect to reach the lost? The enemy loves it when you and I respond in a way that's contrary to Scripture. But the Bible's clear that we are to respond with truth. And with grace, Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. How we respond in times of opposition matter greatly. Number three, don't stop repenting. Don't stop repenting. Oftentimes Christians are hated and they're labeled as hypocrites. And a lot of times those accusations that we receive are correct. We are not perfect beings, even as believers. We are going to sin. We're going to fall short of God's glory. So we need to continue to repent. Repent of your hypocrisy where it's needed. And give the world an opportunity to see your humility. They're looking at the ways that we mess up. They're seeing the ways that we sin. They're seeing the ways that we fall short. So be quick to repent and quick to show humility in the fact that, yes, I do continue to fall short of God's glory. Number four, don't stop loving one another. Don't stop loving one another. Belonging to a faith family is such a great comfort. And I hope that during this time, that's even more clear to you than it's ever been. 
I have always loved my faith family. But the, you know the old saying that distance makes the heart grow fonder? I believe that this is true because uh, not being with my faith family has, has caused a greater longing in me. Uh, through the, throughout the last couple of weeks, there have been times where uh, I've received text messages or I've sent text messages or I've called or received calls. Uh, I've seen some of you just randomly out in town. And it just does my heart, uh, brings my heart great joy to know that, man, my, I love my faith family. They love me. There's a great concern and a great desire for us to be back together. But don't stop loving one another. When we face challenges, a lot of times we can act like the world and we can turn on each other like wild animals. But we've got to continue to preach to ourselves Ephesians six twelve, which says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Pray for other churches. Especially during this time, we are in uncharted waters. These are things that we're experiencing that we've never experienced before. And pastors do not know how to handle these situations. Do we have church? Do we cancel church? Do we have a service online? Do we not? How do we do things? What are we? There's, there are a lot of questions concerning pastors right now that pastors are concerned about. So be praying even for other churches that they would handle things in, in, in a way that pleases the Lord. Because there's gonna, within a faith family, you know this to be true, I know this to be true, there are varying opinions about what we should do and how we should do things. Uh, so be understanding and loving during this time as well. Number five, don't stop loving your enemies. It's imperative that we understand that the gospel is for everyone and that without a move of the Holy Spirit, you and I can do absolutely nothing. Love your enemies and treat them like Jesus has treated you. 1 Peter 3, 9 says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Number six, don't stop looking for Jesus. Don't stop looking for Jesus. He is coming back. You and I, in the midst of it all, have a reason for hope. We have a song to sing. And we have a message to proclaim boldly. Another passage from 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5.10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What a beautiful promise from God's word. Remain firm, remain steadfast in your trial. When your difficulties seem to be unending, when the rotting culture around you seems to be worsening at a breakneck pace, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. And along with any opposition that you may face in your Christian life, understand this as well. Sometimes, sometimes you're going to receive deceptful admiration. You're going to receive decept deceptful admiration. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. But listen. Sometimes people are going to recognize those good works in you and they're not going to give glory where it's due. They're going to give you the praise. They're going to give you the glory. Oftentimes praise is, is given, but it's not followed. There were many who would follow Jesus and they would praise him for the great things he would do, that he had done, but there was no way that they were going to leave their families. There was no way that they were going to give uh, like God had called them to give. There was no way that they were going to make him Lord of their life. And many will admire and praise you as well for the things you do for Christ, for the boldness you have. But they're going to admire you from a distance with no plans on following your example. And perhaps the saddest response to the truth is fear. Fear. There were several who witnessed the miracles of Jesus. There were several who now, since Jesus had commissioned the disciples, were seeing their miracles as well. And there was no denying what they were doing, but fear overcame them. Herod was one of those who was, fear, who was fearful. He was scared of John the Baptist. When he heard about Jesus, he immediately thought about that being John the Baptist raised from the dead. And the Bible says in verse 20 that he was greatly perplexed. 
He knew that John the Baptist was a righteous man. And he even kept him safe to an extent. But Herod, something about Herod, he was a spineless coward. And he gave in to the wishes of this girl and her mother that wanted John dead. It seemed if Herod was the kind of man that wanted to, to fear everyone. You know, there was just, there was, I don't know, you would think that in a prominent position that he was in, that he would be a very bold and flamboyant type of leader. But we can see through the scriptures that he was a very fearful man. He was a people pleaser. And he wanted to please everyone except the one that mattered the most. You know, I thought about that when, when I thought about these three questions when I was looking, uh, studying this passage of scripture, this particular section. What if we were people? of such godliness that others feared mistreating us, others feared speaking against us because of the obvious innocence that we have. What if you and I, like John, were known more for the love that we had for God and his word more than anything else in the world? Herod could look at the life of John the Baptist and see his contentment was not found in what he had, but his contentment was found in who he was in Christ Jesus. What if we denounced sin and we called it what it was and we called people to repentance everywhere that God had purposely placed us? It was not coincidental that John the Baptist found himself around Herod. God places us in specific places purposeful places as well. You work where you work for a reason. It's not accidental where you go to school or where you shop. It's not accidental that you're uh, stuck with your family during this time of quarantine. God has placed you where you are at for a specific purpose. Well, Herod, Herod was a man that was a coward, and Herod knew it. He knew he was a coward. And John the Baptist never had to defend his character with Herod or anything like that. And he never had to bow down to Herod and say, I'm sorry, but this is the truth. He just boldly preached the truth, and Herod was offended by it. John the Baptist was a man of character, a man that walked with God at all times, in public and in private. What about us? Can that be said of us? Are we just Christian? Are we just living a life that appears to be a faithful follower of Christ in the right people, in front of the right people. Because John the Baptist was a man that was a faithful follower in public and in private. When following Christ, some may fear you, but number two, some may also be confused by you. Some may be confused by you. There's no doubt that Herod had dealt with some confusion. When he heard about the ministry of Jesus and all the miracles that he performed, Herod, again, going back to what we mentioned a while ago, he thought that this was John the Baptist raised from the dead. There's a lot of confusion going on in his mind. But I want you to think about the background of Herod's belief that John had somehow come back from the dead. Verses 17 through 29 take us back in time to the events of John the Baptist. And Mark actually helps us to see that Herod's flashback uh, uh, regarding the death of John the Baptist. So Herod's in a battle here, and his confusion is obvious. But I want to, verses 17 and 18, we're told that Herod arrested John for preaching against his sins. But before we get into anything else, I want you to take a quick look back at Herod's family tree. Uh, And you'll see it's kind of crazy, but just stay with me. Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. His half-brothers are Aristobulus, who who was killed by his own father, and Herod Philip. Herod the Great had at least five wives and had sons and daughters by each one of those wives. Herod Antipas, the the man in today's message, married the daughter of an Arabian king. Herod Philip, his half-brother, married Herodias, who is the the woman that's in our passage today, who was the daughter of his half-brother Aristobulus. She was his half-niece. They had a daughter named Salome, the girl who danced for Herod Antipas, her double half-uncle and stepfather. Uh, Herod Philip was disinherited by his father, Herod the Great, and he and Herodias had moved to Rome because of that. Herod Antipas and his wife visited his brother in Rome, and Herod Antipas there fell in love with his half-niece and sister-in-law, Herodias. They had an affair, both left their spouses, and they married one another. 
And I know that that sounds like an episode of Jerry Springer. Uh, it's crazy to, to think of all that, that went down within that family. But when Herod was around, John, John preached against incest, and he preached against adultery from the Word of God. And so Herod, knowing that this was true, was upset with John and had him thrown into prison to save maybe some embarrassment. Now this is unfortunately the all too common response to biblical preaching even today. When a preacher takes the word of God and he preaches the truth from it, sometimes there's going to be a a time where it, it hits a nerve with people. It disturbs people. But it's actually God that is doing the offending. When that happens, and it happens even to believers, as we're hearing the Word of God preached to us, we know that there are times when the Word of God just cuts us to the core. And when that happens, you and I have several choices that we can make. Number one, you can ignore the message. A lot of times people do that. They hear it, they know that it's true, and their way of responding to it is to just ignore it and pretend that nothing has ever happened. And that's dangerous because it can lead to a dead, seared conscience. And number two, you can attack the messenger. This is also very dangerous because God will judge you and I for our response to conviction. But if the preacher is preaching the truth, he's just delivering the mail. If you and I have an issue, we should take it up with the author of the word and not the messenger. Number three, which is the, the, the one that is preferred, and the one I think that we can see from Scripture is biblical, you can bring your need to the Lord. You can submit to the Lord, and he will bring you to a place of repentance and blessing. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, we are quickly approaching a time when preachers in our country are going to be persecuted for the message that we preach. If a liberal Congress has its way, preachers will be imprisoned for the words that they say, for the things that the Bible says Is sin, and we're just simply the messengers of what the Bible says. Even the gospel is being called hate speech by those who reject the Lord Jesus. The days are coming when those who stand for the truth are going to face hardship and are going to face persecution. But even in the midst of his anger at John, Herod kept him alive. Now, he obviously disliked the message that John preached, But he still protected him to an extent. But Herodias refused to forgive John for what he preached. And she continued to grow in her hatred and her bitterness and her animosity for the prophet. And it's easy to see Herod's confusion. He hates the conviction of the truth about his sins, but he still wants to keep John around. You know that there's something going on within his mind. But this same love-hate relationship even exists in our world today between the the preacher and some of those that he preaches to. They hate it when the truth is preached and when their sin is exposed, yet they don't hesitate to call him when they have a need in their life. Being raised in a pastor's home, I saw this scenario played out over and over and over again. It's almost like people thought that they were okay with God as long as they were okay with the preacher. Uh, you know, I'll have people that will um, use foul language or tell a dirty joke or say something that they shouldn't have or do something they shouldn't do in, in my presence. And instead of responding and, and begging for God to forgive them, they'll say, oh, my bad preacher, sorry preacher, as if I have some kind of direct connection to God that they don't have. How sad it is to see these things. Well, verse 20 is a pretty interesting verse of Scripture. Herod had a respectful fear of John the Baptist because he knew what kind of man that John was. He knew that he was a genuine man of God. He knew that he was a holy and righteous man, is what the Word tells us. And he watched. The Bible says that he observed John. That is, he kept him safe under constant guard for whatever reason. He didn't want John to expose his sin, but he didn't want anything bad to happen to John either. When Herod heard that John, uh, heard of John, again, he was perplexed. 
And because of what he heard, it caused, caused great conflict in his heart. He would heard the truth, and he recognized it as truth. Perhaps, perhaps Herod did some of the things that John told him to do. Perhaps Herod was disturbed over some of his sin. He may have even reformed his life up to a certain point, but not to the point to where he'd give up uh, and stood up to Herodias and stood up to his friends, stood up to those around him. The truth may have touched his heart at some point, but not to the point of repentance. The most amazing part of this verse is where the Bible tells us that Herod heard John greatly. He heard him greatly. He enjoyed hearing John preach the word of God, but he had no intention uh, of surrendering his life to Christ. What a confused man. Far too many people like, are like that today. They, they get caught up in the preaching or the, the personality of a man, but they miss the point of the message. They like to be entertained. They like to see somebody with a flamboyant personality, but they don't take heed to the message. They like to hear their favorite preacher preach. There's no intention of doing what the Bible is commanding them to do. What a deceitful way to think, to, to live, that you, know, you think that you're living within the will of God when really all you are is being entertained by a personality. Herod toyed around with the things of God, and he, treated, he got to the point where he treated John the Baptist like a, like a puppet. And by doing these things, the Bible tells us that he seared his conscience by disobeying the word of God. If the Lord's been speaking to you through his word about any area of your life that, that where you need repentance, you need to confess sin, you need to grow, maybe as a, a father leading your family, uh, maybe being more bold at work, uh, maybe students being uh, more bold in, 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 at school, whatever the case may be, obey his word without delay. As we've said often, times delayed obedience is still disobedience when you tell God to wait even though you might be intending to later on down the road do what he tells you to do delaying that obedience is still disobedience and we finally want to want to understand number three when following Christ some may want you dead some may want you dead as tragic as the death of John the Baptist was it's pretty obvious that Herodias was looking for an opportunity to kill him, to have him done away with. There was a big birthday party that was thrown for Herod. And the Bible indicates that the, the list of those who were invited was an impressive list. The Bible uh, includes nobles and military leaders and the leading men of Galilee. Uh, teenagers would say that, man, all of the cool people were there. I mean, the, the red carpet was laid out for those who were in attendance to this uh, this party. And just picture the environment, drinking, dancing, uh, just the list goes on and on. And then Herodias's daughter comes in and danced. The types of, of dance that were normally performed at these type of events was sensual and was very erotic. And that's not really surprising when we know and understand uh, Herod's character and his reputation and obviously the dancing pleased everyone that was in attendance. So much so that Herod offers to, offered her any wish that she wanted up to even half of his entire kingdom. You know, whether that half of his entire kingdom is something literal or not, we know that what Herod was offering her was tremendous. And so when, when she was offered these things, the first thing that she did was she sought her mother's advice. What, what, should, I, what should I ask for? Mom, give me some advice. Give me uh, some uh, discernment here. What should I ask for? And immediately, without hesitation, she requests the head of John the Baptist. Her daughter goes back and even adds a little to that. She says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The sickness of sin will take you to deeper depths of evil than you've ever imagined possible. And that's exactly what we see here with Herodias and her daughter. You see... What we see, and even what Herod saw in John the Baptist, his innocence meant nothing at this point. It meant absolutely nothing at this point. You may be at a, a place in your life where there's some innocence, so you think. 
Man, I, I'm, I'm living for Christ more than I ever have before in my life. I, I don't treat people wrong. I treat people with respect and love and kindness. I go to uh, the nth degree to make people comfortable, to, to, to be welcoming to people. But just because you and I may be perceived as innocent, it means nothing either. This world can and will turn on you without warning because of the faithfulness that you show toward Christ. And perhaps the saddest thing here is that Herod knows, he knows that this is wrong, but he's so henpecked and afraid of his wife, and he's so afraid uh, of going back on what he had said in front of all his friends, in front of all these nobles, in front of all these powerful people, that he risked the life of another man. He risked the life of a godly man, all because of his pride. As Scripture tells us, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Herodias hated and feared John because she knew that his message that he preached was true. And it cut to the bone and it offended her. And she would go to any lengths to have his mouth shut, to get him out of there so that she could carry on and live her life the way she wanted to without there being any disruption. With everything that you and I know about John the Baptist, it is safe to say bad things do happen to good people. It rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. Folks, life is not always fair. Life is not always fair as, as, as we see fair being. That's why you and I have such comfort when we know the nature of God, when we know the characteristics of God, knowing that, that God is omniscient, that He knows all things. When you're falsely accused, when you're done wrong, when people hate you for the wrong reasons, and nobody else understands it or believes it, God knows it. God is in your corner. Knowing that God is not only omniscient, but he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Nothing goes on, nothing happens without God knowing about it and allowing it to happen. And the Bible teaches us that he will not allow any unrighteous deed to go on unpunished. So the things that, that a lot of times in the flesh you want to lash out and control by yourself, when you just want to throat punch somebody because of something they've said to you or done to you, don't have that attitude. Know that God will take care of things in his time. Now, we know that this is a very tragic passage of Scripture. And it serves as a reminder that God is no less in control. Some people would have looked at the things that, they would have looked at the life of John the Baptist and they would have seen what happened to him being beheaded and they would have said, where was God in all of this? Where is God in all of this? God is no less in control in this situation than he is today in the current situation that we live in. And there are many, like Herod, that would give anything to hear John the Baptist preach the word one more time. Knowing what he knows now, he would respond in obedience and give his life to Christ. But that time has passed for Herod. He rejected the truth. And now he lives with the consequences. What about you? How are you responding to the truth that you've been given? Is God calling you to turn from your sins and to trust in the sacrifice of his son for righteousness, for forgiveness today? Trust in him. Christian, have you counted the cost of serving and following Christ? Have the recent, has the recent pandemic caused you to think about the brevity of life? Has it created a sense of urgency within you to share the gospel with those around you that you know are lost? Redeem the time. If nothing else, this is a time where many people are thinking about death. How am I going to make it? Who am I going to re rely on? Who am I going to trust in? The government's limited. My boss has laid me off. This pandemic has caused chaos. Where do I turn to? What do I turn to in a time like this? The fields are ripe for the harvest, but the workers are few. 
Will you redeem the time? Will you redeem the opportunity that God has laid before us? I want to share one short thing with you that, that I read this morning, as a matter of fact. I love to read uh, different articles. I come across a lot of articles on the Internet um, that, are, that are really good. Uh, many of you share articles with me uh, from time to time during the week, and I appreciate that. But this one come, is... Um, this lady is a writer for the Gospel Coalition. Her name is Kim Seville. And um, the title of it is Quarantine is Hard, but God is Good. And um, she talks about Psalm 57. Psalm 57 is a psalm of David, and it's written in a cave while he is being actively hunted. And I imagine that he could relate to the feelings of isolation and fear that many in our country are dealing with even today. And what does it look like? For you and me to run to God as our refuge, to say along with David, in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until the storms of destruction shall pass. She says, it looks like resting in the truth and responding in faith. David rests in the truth of who God is and what he has done. Verse 1 talks about God's mercy. God is merciful. And she says, for when I lost it with my kids... And I feel, like a fav- uh, I feel like a failure. She's reminded that God is merciful. There, there's some of you that are locked in the, your home with your children right now. And they are, are, are testing. They're, they're on that last nerve. Be encouraged that God is merciful. When you feel like losing, losing it, and when you do lose it with your children time and time again, uh, realize that God is merciful. Number two, he fulfills his purpose for you. When you can't go to your job and you're struggling with your worth, when you're struggling with identity problems, God fulfills that purpose for you. He is who we are. He is our identity. Verse 3, he has sent from heaven and saved me. When you need to be reminded that you trust in God, a God who doesn't just listen to your cries for mercy, but who entered fully into pain and gave his life so that you might live. Number four comes from verse 10. His love and faithfulness are steadfast to the heavens. When everything around us feels uncertain and hard, God knows, God sees, and God never changes. The second thing she discusses is that David responds in faith based upon who God is and what he's done. Verse 4 and verse 6 allude to the fact that he cries out to God with honesty about his feelings and about his situations. The danger is real and the temptations to fear or despair seem ever-present, but there's somewhere to turn. There's someone to turn to. Not only that, verse 7 alludes to the fact that he trusts, the psalmist trusts. His heart is steadfast because why? Because God is steadfast and he is, he's able to be steadfast because he's following a God who is steadfast. Verses 8 and 9, uh, it says that he sings and he gives thanks. If he can find things to, to sing about and to thank God for from inside a cave, then you and I can too. You and I can praise God. You and I can sing and give thanks to God even in the times of despair. Verses 8 and 9 indicates that he has a hope. He hopes for the future. He looks forward to the time when he'll once again be able to gather with God's people for worship. I think about that when David was in this cave. He had to long to be together with other brothers and sisters who were like-minded in the faith and, and, and just grab hold of that fellowship again that had sustained him time after time again. And you and I long for that. We long for the time where we can worship together and ultimately when the earth will be filled with God's praises. She goes on and finishes by saying, One of the devil's favorite devices is to try to make us dwell on the hardness of things in general and to make us feel as if they would always go on like this, but they will not. They are shadows that will pass. This shadow will pass. So let's not lose hope. Let's press on. Let's rest in the truth. And let's respond in faith, knowing that our God has always and will always work everything for our good and his glory. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful for the promises that we do see in your word. We're faithful. We're thankful, God, that, that, that you are faithful and that we always have 
someone to turn to. God, I pray that you would remove from us any anxiety. And God, help us to see our current situation as an open door. Lord, I pray that we will uh, be void of what we see in the life of Herod. Lord, Lord, so many times we are guilty of wanting to be people pleasers. Lord, help us, if, if we're guilty of that, to repent of that. Lord, to run from that and be focused on you and pleasing you and no one else. God, I thank you for my faith family. And I long for the day that we are able to come back together. But God, I pray that as Mount Zion Baptist Church is able to come back together, that each one of us will have a story to tell. That each one of us will be able to say with confidence, listen to what God has taught me in this time. Listen to the doors of opportunity that have opened up before me. I was able to lead as a father. I was able to share with my neighbor. I was able to to minister to those that I work with. Lord, Lord, I I anticipate those types of stories, those types of, of, of praises when we are able to come and assemble together once again. But God, until that time presents itself, if that time presents itself, Lord, I pray that you would continue to teach us through it all. Lord, we know that we, you've not given us a spirit of fear. God, I pray that we would, we would run from any thoughts of, of any fear and anxiety. But God, embrace the opportunity that's before us. We love you, Father, and we just thank you that we do have an opportunity, even, even amongst what we're going through, to, to still have a way of hearing your word uh, and, and, and worshiping with our faith family, even though it is at a distance. God, we love you. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.